Well, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us at the uh, NYC Dam Meetup. Uh, we are still the world's largest dam meetup uh, with 700 members uh, and counting. Today's topic, of course, is dam and luxury brands. So we have two luxury brands. Uh, with uh, very specific questions already in mind, how are you involved with digital asset management uh, to start with uh, so that we get a uh, feel and more understanding of what you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis? Please. Okay. Thank you, Henrik. So as far as you know, where we are involved with digital asset management in GlobalEdit, we really work with you know, our clients and the end users to uh, really be uh, on their side in setting up uh, the right creative workflow. For, so for some organizations, GlobalEdit is only going to be uh, a product specifically uh, focused on work in progress to go to that final asset. For some brands and um, really big companies, they're going to use GlobalEdit as their digital asset management and final repository. So we are involved from the time that asset is being created, whether it's a photo, it's you know presentation, it's an InDesign file, it's a video file, all the way to how we're going to secure it, how we're going to uh, make sure that we secure this access, we can share these assets, uh, we can make sure that only the right people can see it, and uh, we can enhance the visibility of uh, the assets that are being managed. So really from the point of creation all the way to the distribution and the securization of these, uh, of these assets. And then since we are web-based and a SaaS system, all the way to um, disaster recovery and backup because we provide these services for our customers at the same time so that their IT doesn't have to worry about it. Hello, um, my role as a corporate archivist manager at the Estee Lauder companies is to, it was one a couple years ago to find a digital asset management system to organize all of our final assets, um, anything that is consumer facing. And our archives are strictly um, for our employee use. Um, so that was one of my roles. The second one was to work with the vendor and our IT team, which is um, the technical team and the security to see uh, what would be the best fit and security wise due to rights usage and lots of confidential material um, that we have at the archives. And lastly, my role for digital asset management is to upload content, to tag for metadata, to download and also manage the system as our requests come in and fulfill them through Lightboxes. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so I'm, my role is a metadata architect, which is a kind of strange title. Um, so one of uh, my major tasks is to make sure that our schema is uh, appropriate to our users so that we are actually fulfilling their metadata needs. Um, I also work very heavily with our taxonomy. So um, you know, making these controlled lists, making sure that we're all using the same language. That's a, a very huge challenge because everyone calls things, everything, uh, you know, five different ways. Um, so that's kind of my role, like, in general. I also, uh, you know, work with our users sort of doing requirement gathering for um, updates to our system. Our system is very new. We've had it for, well, it's been live for less than a year. I think it went live in October. So. Uh, I work actually with the users, talking to them about what they need, what they want to do, how they want this uh, system to, be, to behave, uh, and then talk to our developers and uh, sort of translate that in somewhat of a business analyst way, but sort of understanding how digital asset management is used by our users uh, and also understanding the IT part of it. So that's my major role. Uh, so next question, uh, if you worked previously with a dam uh, elsewhere, how is working with a luxury brand the same or different with other organizations with a different mission? I can definitely answer that one. Um, uh, so before I worked at Tiffany, I worked at New York Public Library, and as you can imagine, NYPL is a very different beast than Tiffany and Company. Uh, the aims are very different. Um, so before, um, we had it wasn't necessarily a dam, it's actually more uh, a digital catalog in a CMS because it was supporting the digital gallery in NYPL. And it was based on MODS, the uh, Library of Congress standards. So 
It was very simple because all we had to do was use all of the fields from mods and tell the users, here are your fields, here's all your Library of Congress uh, uh, you know, control vocabularies, go crazy. And they were librarians and they knew what they were doing. Um, and here at, uh, at Tiffany, it's uh, an entirely brand new uh, schema that's made for them. It's a taxonomy that's made for them. They don't all understand using all these controlled vocabularies. Um, and they also feel that um, it's, they need to actually make it very pretty. That's one of the things I've noticed about luxury brands is that you, know, you can give a librarian, you can give someone an MOPL, like, okay, here's your software. And they're like, oh, okay, and they just enter their fields. But with, with Dan, with luxury, it was like, this has to be shiny, it has to be new, it has to be like super easy to use. And you're like, there are a lot of challenges because you just actually even, not so much the functionality of the system, but just making it look nice is a, a huge difference. Um, so it's sort of the, the difference in the two worlds. Um, mine is short. So we got our dam system last year in July. It went live. Other than that, we did use Excel spreadsheets, and we still are using Excel spreadsheets to catalog uh, material and use our server as kind of our dam system in folders. Um, so right now, when we use our dam system, um, we do upload most more re requested material and also all of our advertising and uh, commercials. And, um, and for metadata also, we needed to find a system that if somebody requested they wanted all butterflies in their ad, we could type butterflies and find them. And this, um, I've never worked in a library or a different institution. I always worked at the Estee Lauder companies, but we do have different needs um, compared to the institutions of um, requesting, you know, puppies to um, a certain person and um, a certain background in the advertising. Um, so that metadata needed to be in our digital asset management. So that was very key to finding a solution for it. Yeah, on, on my side, uh, you know, I can talk on the other side as a software vendor providing, you know, service and, uh, and consulting services and a service to different industries. So definitely, you know, to luxury brands, but as well to, you know, creative agencies, to advertising agencies, to, you know, TV networks, uh, retailers, and, you know, just fashion companies, um, you know, all the way to some of the cheapest brands that are still doing really nice photography. And I can tell you the challenges are definitely different. So, um, you know, um, when you are, you know, dealing with an e-commerce company who needs to shoot, you know, hundreds of products every single day, you are not taking, you know, the same time to uh, master your metadata and probably to secure your assets as well. Um, you know, so, you know, the challenges are different. The speed is totally different about implementing a system. The speed is different about how people, how fast actually the people work through these assets, how fast you need to fulfill you know, a task or request for an asset. Um, so, you know, it's, it really depends. Um, you know, when you're talking about high speed production, you cannot afford to spend as much time uh, as when you're actually spending, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars just for one single shoot to get that beautiful picture that's gonna be used in that campaign. It's just not doable. So you just have to know pretty much what is the goal of the uh, digital asset manager or taxonomy specialist or um, you know software vendor as global edit about like where do you stand in this and what is the biggest challenge that uh, the end user is facing every day is it accessing the right asset in a quarter of a second or is it making sure that in two minutes i can get the 50 images that i want to review that i know are going to be used for a mood board for xyz you know, a ca campaign or, um, you know, an archive project because we need to communicate on a certain value that the brand has. And I think, you know, we, we see, really see it all. Um, and for, uh, in some companies or even luxury brands, we see totally different uses of the same system. So the photography department is going to be so different from the archive department. It's going to be totally different from the PR and marketing. And they work at different speed. They have different ways of working. They might have different metadata schema, different ways of securing their data. And I think that's something that everybody needs to be aware of. It's like, it's not one system, one company, everybody's happy, everybody works the same way. Um, you know, it's, it's something that we are 
you know, learning every time we walk into a company, even if it's a luxury company, we're gonna talk to basically five sub companies within a company and everybody's gonna have different advice and different opinions on how it should be done. And I think that's a challenge that, you know, we deal with every single day because we need to make these five sub companies happy no matter what. Great, and that's a perfect segue actually. So uh, next question is, uh, uh, can you share some uh, successes and challenges with digital asset management, please? So, um, you know, successes is, you know, happy customer, Melissa is here. So, you know, that's, you know, that's, that's the success when you have, you know, a, a brand that never had a system, never had a way to fulfill the request for, you know, photography or, or, or video and now can actually share with any of, you know, the estate other brands. Being able to, you know, fulfill your request in a matter of minutes, send a light box, like give out the two videos and the five pictures that you're looking for, and make sure that you're actually providing the right content. That's that's a success. Um, you know, for some companies, it's going to take two days to get there. For some companies, it's going to take two years to get there. So all the way, you know, the um, you know some measure of the success is, you know, not really any of the three of us. It's actually who is actually going to use it at the end. So how fast you can get access to your assets, how secure your assets are, how, sh how sure are you uh, that your assets are secure and accessible only by the right people, how do you make sure that the rights and the copyrights are you know, being respected in the different company, in the different departments, and for the different uses? Because all of us now you know, have to deal with print. That's good, it's all industry, it's still happening, and web, and now what is the use for video? And you know you have the photographer rights, and you have the model rights, and you have the uh, director rights. And how do we deal with that? At the end of the day, is you know do we have a lawsuit or not? Do we have happy uh, end users who are just uh, being able to actually uh, help themselves in the dam and just get the assets that they want without calling us? So basically, if people don't call us, that they don't find things, or they wish they should find it another way, or they should find it faster. That's to us pretty much how we measure success. That means it's been set up the right way. It's secure, it's totally backed up. The metadata has been set up the right way. People who are supposed to populate the metadata fields are doing it the right way at the right time in the creative workflow, whether it's you know, at, at the time you create this asset during you know, approval process or filing or afterwards you know, as a final repository. All of these things are what we are looking for. It is the happiness of the end user that to us is really the uh, how we measure the success of a dam system. You touched on all of mine. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, we use Global Audit, and we're very happy. Um, so to, uh, what was it, probably a year and a half ago, or two years, uh, I've met, I met them at the Creative Sphere, and so it was a test, and the one test was upload and download speed, which approved, and uh, they have a great uh, plugin called Aspera, um, so I actually just uploaded a movie that was probably 10 minutes long and it took uh, about less than a minute to upload this morning. Um, and it was easy to access to three of my users, my end users of um, Aramis that wanted to see this video. The second test was security, um, how secure was their website, and also usage rights, because all of our assets do not have um, either, our usage rights are ended because they're from 1930s to 1980s, so um, we needed it very secure, we needed a watermark on it if we needed to show it to someone, or access that they can't even download it, they only could view it. Um, so they, um, we got approved and we got Global Edit for the whole year <laughs> and going on hopefully number two years um, next July. Um, and we love them, they have the best customer service. Today I had a problem uploading it because there was a coding problem and I didn't have to email them, they emailed me and they say, what's wrong with you? We're getting errors on our end. Um, so the customer service is great. Um, one of our goals was to be an archive that would serve globally to all of our regions, to Asia, to UK, to Canada, um, so we didn't have to send them a CD in the mail of five movies and they get it in a week. Um, so now they can go to Global Edit and we send them a light box for that and it works and it's some fast time of what they download. Um, another, let me see, success story. The success story is it's user friendly as you saw in the PowerPoint. It's really easy to use. The metadata is there, you can customize it. 
um, any problems, they're always looking for ideas. So uh, we always have chats on what, what works, what doesn't work for us. Um, so it's really great. Um, the challenges is not on the global edit side, it's on our IT side. So it was very hard to kind of sign on and tell IT, you need to open up a firewall for everybody, 32,000 people in our company, so they have access to downloading these assets because this is what we're going to be using. Um, and another challenge is just end user error of maybe the Java is not working and or they don't know how to download and I don't have time to explain what they download so Global Edit would send me a PDF of how they could download it or somebody's actually there on the other end in minutes that I was on vacation saying I'll take care of this and I'll help them so they're very good in that um, so the challenges make it a positive that they really uh, fulfill uh, these issues quickly and resolve them um, for quick deadlines of re one of our biggest challenges is getting, uh, making everyone happy. Um, and like you said, there's like five companies within the company. Um, you know, I, our system right now uh, sort of started as a, a marketing initiative. Um, they needed something to store all their assets. Um, so we've got people who are in marketing. We've got creative visual marketing. We've got production. We've got public relations. We've got the corporate archives group, uh, social media. Uh, so all of these different groups, and they all have different needs, and they all have, you know, it must be done now. So I think that's our biggest challenge is sort of making a system that works for everyone, or at least attempts to work for everyone. Um, so the challenge of, of really sort of understanding how our teams work, I think, was, was the biggest problem that we ran into in the start, because our system, as I said, is very young. Um, really sort of knowing their workflow, how they want to use the, the system, um, and, and making the system work for them instead of them having to climb uphill to use the system. Uh, and we've gotten so far since October. I mean, I think uh, it was actually in a meeting today where, you know, our, like one of the heads of marketing was like, this is such an improvement. This is really, you know, like this has come a long way. We can actually use this now because um, one of the complaints, unfortunately, was that they couldn't really use it back in October. But to hear that from him was like this great success. I was like, oh, awesome, um, because we've had a lot of like hair pulling. We're just like, oh, this is not working. Um, but now that it is, um, you know, we're just really sort of hitting our stride um, and and getting everyone's workflow in. I think that's that's one of our biggest challenges. Um, and also, I have to say, just for my part, the metadata is a huge challenge um, because we don't have, you know, librarians. We have marketing people. So getting getting them to understand why they need to tag their assets, not just say, oh, I put it in a file folder, um, and how they need to tag it and why we have all these control lists, um, sort of making them understand that um, and getting them to do it, um, that's our ongoing challenge. So. But we're working on it. Our global audience, our global DAM audience, and our meetup members have varying levels of experience. What advice would you like to share with DAM professionals and people aspiring to become DAM professionals? Okay. I want to be first on this one. <laughs> um, uh, so obviously, um, get yourself educated. Um, just jump in there. I know I, I saw just recently on the uh, the damn community on LinkedIn, there were like discussions about all these classes that are going on. That's definitely, I think, a great idea um, because I think a lot of the things uh, for digital asset management has been uh, jump in the pool by yourself and learn. Um, that's definitely how I learned it. Um, I come from straight library metadata background, so everything damn was sort of sink or swim. Uh, but get educated and definitely, you know, talk to your peers, come to these groups, because I think hearing about other people's experiences, talking to them um, definitely puts you in the right place to sort of make that connection and get, get yourself educated. I will second that. Um, I do not have an archives degree. I graduated with marketing and advertising, so I also jumped into this role eight years ago and absolutely loved it. And now part of so many communities and networking and Society of American Archivists, um, taking those workshop classes. Damn is hot. Like this is a new topic in archives and um, in this 
uh, this role of um, electronic records, like everything is born digital now and everything needs to be preserved and archived. Um, people are looking back in history and want to organize it. Um, so take those classes, network internships are great. Um, and uh, the more practice, and if you're looking for a dam system, it's always good to, you know, get those key, key things that you're looking for and network. Uh, the way we found Global Edit was we loved them, but we also wanted some reviews. So I had to speak to other people that were using them and find out what those pros and cons are. So if you find that person that um, works in the same field as a business archives or uh, an institutional archives, definitely work with them and find out what their system is, what works for them, and um, take it from there. Yeah, I have a technical background, so I started, you know, really on the other side uh, of, of, of this industry. But on my side, you know, coming from the technical background, I would, you know, the advice was like, yes, education is the first thing you have to get. Understand what the challenges are. But, you know, not only the tools to actually solve these challenges or address some of the things that need to be addressed, but the end view of what an organization is trying to achieve or what an, uh, an organization is not achieving by not having a dam. So I think, you know, like just taking, you know, a step back sometimes really help understanding what are we trying to achieve? What are the biggest challenges that the organization is facing today? Is it a matter of security? Is it, you know, and then this is where your education is going to do. Is it a matter of searchability and, and how we access these files and these metadata and assets, like, you know what, this is where your taxonomy background and education is going to help you. And, you know, going back to, you know, the end user role and the IT and legal, and like, what are they looking for in the dam? Or why do they not implement something? Like, why is there no dam in my, in my company? And, you know, like being able to answer these, like really, you know, basic question at the end of the day, like why am I in, that, in, in this industry? Why am I even working? Once you understand really clearly what the answer is to these questions, like the education is really gonna get you to the next step, like what should be the tools that I'm using? You know, and then, you know, the LinkedIn group and the meetups and all the industry, you know, conferences are really, you know, and of course, you know, go to school, take classes, um, you know, to, to make sure that, you know, you're getting the right education to solve every and each of these challenges and know what is out there. So it's a lot of time about, you know, read, 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 talk, meet people, network, you know, see what works, see what doesn't work, discuss if your challenges are actually the same one than the person sitting next to you. Because there's a big chance that, you know, we all have the same challenges in this room. We're trying to solve the exact same problems whether we are in one industry or another, you know, the, the, the challenges are the same and the, and the drivers behind them systems are the same in every single industry. The focus, as we said, you know, in the luxury industry might be specific, um, you know, to, uh, to some particular aspects of the, uh, the digital assets, but the main challenges are exactly the same than other corporations. So, you know, whether you're a nonprofit or luxury brand or fashion brand, an e-commerce company or a TV network, at the end of the day, like what am I trying to achieve? Once you get that, you know, basically go full speed in getting the education that is focused to these features. Uh, and then, you know, then be useful to your peers. That means share this information, whether it's about vendors or it's about technology, or it's about just things that you happen to know. And, you know, usually people will give it back to you. So that works. Sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing. Uh, don't be afraid to specialize. I'm not saying like get, you know, be super narrow, um, but it, I feel like there's so much to, to DAM that um, you can really get lost trying to learn everything about it. Um, so if you find that like, you know, you're really good at X part of it or Y part of it, don't be afraid to like, that's my thing. Like, yeah, I do DAM, but I'm really good at taxonomy too. And like, let me at it, I'll go for it. Um, because I feel like you can come at these these jobs sort of in a roundabout way, you know, like you might not have the digital asset manager title, but you might start, you know, doing metadata, you might start doing taxonomy, and then suddenly you're sort of balled up into that role. So don't be afraid if you're only focused on one thing right now. You might get, might get much larger. So next question, are luxury brands finally finding the value in digital asset management? I think so. 
I think the, the, the answer is yes. Um, it, it took a while. Um, you know, it definitely took a while. Um, now, where are all the luxury brands in that, you know, in, in that, you know, path? And how far and how fast have been there to actually adapt to them? Or do we have them today? Um, you know, the answer is, you know, not yes for all of them and everything is set and basically we don't have a job because everything is set and it's working. That's not the case. So, you know, I think, you know, luxury brand definitely now value their digital asset um, totally. They know that there is a value in that picture. They know that there is a value in that video file that Melissa was, was talking about. They know that, you know, there is a value in being able to search it in one second because of the right taxonomy that has been set. Now, how fast are you getting there? Um, how much budget is available, how much resources are going to be uh, dedicated to that specific subject. That's, you know, that's really a brand by brand discussion. So, you know, on my side, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be able to talk to, you know, basically tens and hundreds of companies about what do they do, how, we do, how do we do it. So giving a pure picture of the luxury industry based on what I see would be totally wrong. Because I can tell you that small companies, big companies, all companies, companies who are like five year old and that you see in the news every day because they're just booming. These, these needs are a little bit different and the, uh, the speed that they realize that there is a need uh, for a digital asset management system is gonna be totally different. So uh, I think that everybody in the luxury, uh, in the luxury industry now understand the value of the assets, how fast uh, they can go to dedicate resources and budget to actually have them you know, protected and secured and, and make sure that they are uh, actually organized the right way is, is another story. But the value, I think, is here in the entire industry to me. I agree also. The value is here. Um, with SA Lauder companies, if you're not aware, we own um, or we're under the umbrella of 30, I think we're up to 30 brands. and. Um, more of them, I guess, are signing on, as I hear, to Global Edit, and they use it for different um, uses. A creative group will use it, um, uh, an archive downtown will use it, the marketing group will use it, so they all have different needs, um, but they're all producing digital assets, and di digital assets are saved forever. Uh, the need on our end was our server that we couldn't locate anything and we needed to organize in a way that we would understand and also our users would be able to search and find things and it was successful. So it is very big in our company um, and moving to an easier way to upload and download and manage all these assets in one user-friendly, uh, I guess, uh, web base. Um, I'm not really sure what to add on that because it's, it's absolutely true. They do understand, like they know that they need it, um, but you know, I'll just second and third that they know they need it, but I don't think they understand what it takes to have it. So uh, a lot of the challenge is sort of saying, okay, it's great, you're on board. We need you to do X, Y, Z, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you're like, all of this stuff, and they're like, wait, we, we can't just throw it in there and there's metadata, and you're like, no, no, sorry. Someone actually has to do that. So it's uh, the buy-in is there. Now it's the uh, the actual work. So. So next question: uh, What type of digital assets do you or your organization manage, and what are the specific challenges you see on the specific formats? Uh, so. Uh, as I said, we started our digital asset management as sort of a response to our marketing department's needs. Uh, so our digital assets are primarily marketing assets, and that runs the gamut between uh, you know photo uh, photos of you know product, which um, I have to say, when you have that in your digital asset management for Tiffany is a beautiful thing. Um, you can get kind of lost looking at all the, <laughs> the product shots. You're just like, oh, so pretty. Um, so, you know, pictures of products, pictures of, you know, model shots, scenes, all of these components that go into the ad. And then we have composed ads, we have mechanicals, we have layouts, we have, uh, you know, cropping guides, and then we have artwork and directives, and it just, it goes on and we have so many things, and they're so, so, so different. Um, so, you know, we've been creating a massive, massive me metadata schema and a massive taxonomy. Um, so our, our 
our challenge with all these assets has really just been uh, trying to describe them all the best that we can using some sort of standardized language here and there. Um, but uh, we're, we're even trying to go larger. We have, uh, we're collecting emails, we're doing social media posts, so yeah, it's a lot. We have a lot in there. Um, and I mean, on the technical side, if you're talking about any kind of like file formats, we basically have everything you could possibly imagine um, in there, so I hope that answers it. <laughs> We collect, um, not as much as you, <laughs> we keep, um, we collect and maintain all finalized uh, images, anything that the consumer sees. So it could be a product shot, an advertising, a commercial, an interview, um, some press clippings, anything internally that we think it has enduring value to our company we keep. Um, for formats, it could be an MOV file, a JPEG, a TIFF, a PDF, um, challenges that we do have was today when it was m kind of my era of we got an old DVD of a anniversary that we had and I had to convert it to an MOV file and the coding was wrong. Um, so those are the kind of challenges or if there are old files that can't be converted uh, but Global Edit pretty much accepts everything. <laughs> Or they try, and if not, uh, they work on it and fix it for me. Um, and that's pretty much it for the challenges that I have uploading and downloading assets. Yeah. On our side, you know, we're, we're lucky enough to actually be exposed to, you know, many different companies and many different use cases of the software. So as far as the file size or the file types, you know, you're talking about any kind of photo site for you know, from low res e-commerce or like behind the scene, like Instagram type, all the way to the beautiful art photography, CR2, you know, 300, you know, meg file, you know, and now you're talking about, you know, a five second video file, you're talking about a 30 minute, um, you know, video interview or, you know, or, or long form movie and that's behind the scene. You're talking about InDesign files and you know Illustrator files for you know uh, you know some of the uh, creative departments. You're talking about store design plans. You're talking about visual merchandising packaging. You're talking about all of these. You know are gonna have you know PDF file, and Illustrator, and you know TIFF file and JPEG and MOVs and MP3 and MP4 and pro, you know H.264 uh, and ProRes and video. And you know the, the challenge is you know to know what's gonna be coming because that means that in the back end, your DAM system needs to be able to process them, to transcode them, and then to serve them. Because be sure that you know, most of the users are not going to take what was on that old DVD and being able to read it on that, uh, on that station. You know, are they using a Windows machine? Are they using a Mac? Is it, you know, are they accessing through the web? Are they not accessing through the web? All of this actually determines how you're going to deal with these different formats and, you know, for Global Edit, since we have to service for everybody, we have to know what's going to hit us. So we're always on the lookout on new formats that might be coming out, new compression format, new processing, because we need to serve them no matter what. Because nobody's going to tell us, hey, you know, I'm gonna start uploading this file under this compression, and I wanna make sure that it looks nice. Basically, there is an assumption to the DAM vendor and the software vendor that I'm going to upload my file and it's gonna look nice over the web, no matter if I'm using Chrome or Firefox, I just need to look fun or my iPhone or my iPad as I was there. You know, the end user expects it to be rendered, to be secured, to be able to be shared in different formats. And accessing that with that, pretty much you need to try to figure out any kind of file that, ne that might actually be handled and gathered by, uh, you know, the archive department or the library, the digital library, and uh, make sure that you secure it and you can handle it with no issue. Can you speak about uh, the internal challenges that you've seen or, and maybe even the success rate to internal adoption of DAM? Yeah, I think it's, it's key to go back to, uh, you know, one of, one of Miguel's points earlier when, you know, you talked about, you know, taxonomy and metadata and you're like, and it needs to be maintained. So I think you have like two steps in, you know, in, in, in the life of a DAM system in any organization. You have, you know, identifying the right system and then implementing it. So here you have the adoption by the IT team, by legal, by the uh, you know, digital library, by the archive department. These are people 
you know, that I leave through the system, already know the value, already know why it's here, understand, you know, all the intricacies of the system and the challenges that you're trying to, uh, to, uh, to address here. The biggest part is actually the adoption to by the people who actually don't care about what you do. And there are a lot of them out there. They just don't know what the system is for. What is the value? And like, why should they put that extra effort to put that metadata in? Like, what do I get for it? I'm never, I'm never gonna search by, you know, the uh, campaign name, the product ID, and the SKU number. I don't care. Yes, but guess what? You have 5,000 people who are actually gonna search for it in two years from now. So this is, you know, education. This is about putting the value and, you know, making sure that everybody in the organization understand why we're doing this at the company level. This is not a department thing. This is not a one use case thing. This is, you know, an enterprise level system. The reason why we're doing it is that, you know, a state order corporate archives can send a document within a minute, no matter what brand it is in the group, and no matter where you are, uh, you know, on earth, you're gonna get it in a matter of minute. If you wanna make sure that you're going to search for that beautiful ring out of the Tiffany digital library, it needs to be referred the right way. And all of this is work. So if there is the adoption of, yeah, I'm using the system, I know where to click. But then there is the adoption of like, you are required to do that. And this goes from IT to, uh, you know, the end user to people who upload and people who download and people who request. How do you request an asset? How do you tr track the request? How do you, you know, what is your response time? And all of this is education all along the way to the end user. It's education to the decision maker about like, why are we doing that? Why do I need an hour with your team this week to train them on how to access the system, how to get the best value of it? Because people will only do that if at some point they see a value for themselves. I think it's part of you know, who we are as human beings, like as generous as we can be, and everybody is gonna be uh, all, all, always thinking of, of his neighbor here, but you know, at some point if I really don't see a value, the adoption is going to go down. And this can happen in one week, it can happen in one year, it can happen after two years, but no matter what, there's a huge cost is in picking up after when your assets have not been filed the right way, or your security has been compromised, or your DR site or backup has not been handled the right way, or metadata was not complete. Going back to hundreds of thousands of digital assets is a nightmare. That's a nightmare that you wanna go through when you build the library. That's not a nightmare that you wanna go through on an ongoing basis. So, you know, adoption is every day. Every day show the value, every day show back the benefits to the end users so that they actually, you know, see the value, buy in, and actually then do their part so that the system keeps getting better and brings more value to everybody. Our buy-in was easy for our department just because uh, we acquired about 80,000 photos of F.C. Lauder um, going back to the early 60s. Um, it was of the family, it was of corporate, it was, it was everything. And I've ha I had three people scan all the materials and it's like, what next? These are awesome assets and we need the company to know about that and when we have a request, how are we gonna facilitate this that we could send all these assets to them? So that was our kind of buy-in speech to my boss, to IT, to our business relationship manager, um, that we really needed a system that we could not use Excel and not take, um, and buy, you know, four external hard drives from Staples and buy DVD. So it was definitely a cost savings um, in the long run. And it worked. Uh, the metadata, it's still, it, we've been working with Global Audit for a year. Um, everything is not up, but it is a challenge because now we're fixing the metadata, we're fixing um, all of the file names, so everything's correct, so we do not have to take it down and redo it again. So we want it to be perfect before we put it up there. Um, the success story is, um, it's all about metrics in my company. We need to report metrics of what we do in my department. How am I gonna validate my budget and uh, the people that work for me? Uh, so Global Edit has a great reporting tool of what I'm uploading and how many people are downloading it and what they're downloading. And it was good to, at our end of our fiscal year in July, um, it was good to report that and to show now the percentage of how many people are using it next year, next July, and so on and so on. So we're able to report that. And glo globally too, it's a very, it's a success story that um, we could say yes to our end users and they're happy. They're very happy that they're getting material within 24 hours. 
Um, I was working downtown. I wasn't at my office, and I had my iPad on me, and somebody needed a photo. I simply went on my iPad, sent it to them through a light box, and within five seconds, they were like, you're amazing. How did you do this? So um, it was happy. It was great to hear all these success stories through our end users, and that will make them come back to us um, to, to request more material. Um, <clears throat> so I, I absolutely agree with, with both of you. And, and Matthew, adoption every day. It's like the other part of your job as a you know, digital asset manager or whatever your title may be, is that it is every day you are the biggest advocate for your system, that every time you talk to someone about it, you know, you just have to be like, yeah, this is great. This is this is going to solve this problem for you, um, and this is how you do it. Um, and so to to drive adoption, um, obviously that's one of the things I do. Is you know, I sit with users and say, this is how you use it, and they go, oh, I had no idea it did that. And you're like, yep, that's how you do it. Um, that is a success story because suddenly they've figured out you've just made their life easy. Um, so it's that's a wonderful thing for them. Um, the other thing that uh, the challenges that I've encountered, and I think one of our greatest challenges, and I've already mentioned, is that getting that metadata, getting it in and getting it right. Um, so it's our biggest challenge, I think, right now, or one of our biggest challenges. And how we've been approaching it is to try to find ways to get that metadata out of the work they're already doing, because they don't want to sit there and enter metadata. Um, so we've been looking into utilizing XMP fields and having the photographers actually enter information when they shoot the product so that that comes in as soon as we ingest it. Um, for some of our users, we're working on some file naming conventions so that the system pulls that data right out of the file name. Um, we're doing it like the group that we're recommending to use file naming, they're already kind of doing a file naming convention. So we're really just saying, okay, you can keep doing this, but here are some rules. And they don't even really know that they're creating the metadata. So we're sort of utilizing a lot of the automated processes um, and sort of sneakily getting our users <laughs> to create metadata. Um, so that's, I mean, those are sort of our, our wins are sort of, of doing that and approaching our, our big problems. Uh, we have a very large library of assets, um, or a huge backlog. Um, so when, when we're talking about you don't want to go forward with uh, assets that don't have metadata, um, I'm talking about five digits of assets that are sitting there that have a very bare minimal. You can find them, but it's really not that useful, and it needs more. And so I've actually, uh, I've utilized some, some interns and told them, look, you're getting experience in metadata, um, which it's totally valid. So um, <laughs> they are getting experience in metadata, um, but it's, you know, it's getting it in there. So besides keywords, is there any visual search? Uh, uh, other ways to do visual search? Um, instead of searching, do you mean like to just look at the assets itself? Uh, so yeah, what we do, um, for example, for an ad, uh, we would tag it, I say Lauder, we would tag it with the headline, we would pretty much describe the entire ad, what it looked like. Um, so you could search it through that. Instead of going in the search field, you could click on the photo and all of the information would come. Um, Global al Edit also has like a gallery. So if you don't know what you're looking for um, and you wanted to look for the 1960s ads of Estee Lauder, you could just click on uh, you know, a file folder that says 1960s ads, like the way we organize it, and look through the gallery. We are always trying to make our system better to, to reach this kind of functionalities here. There are so many challenges to uh, recognize the butterfly from the next butterfly, to be honest with you, uh, and from the one face to recognize you know, my face from your face. Um, so we've experienced a little bit with face recognition, with lower edit. Um, we deal you know, in the uh, media and entertainment business. We do a lot of talent approval. 
So, um, you know, basically we need to uh, make sure that the three of us are being tagged um, because we have different contract rights on the approval of our images and key rights. And, you know, when we work with, you know, a lot of, you know, TV networks um, or, or like photo studio or photo labs in, in Hollywood, you know, that's what they use Global Edit for. So we're working on it uh, knowing, you know, is face recognition there already to uh, have an accuracy that is good enough to give you more value than what it takes to actually correct it and make it accurate afterwards, we are not there. So our experience is that when we experience with shape recognitions, butterfly recognition, we haven't tried, but pretty much the same, face recognitions, like what is our accuracy rate and how much time are we going to save compared to basically having somebody clicking on our free faces, you know, face, like Facebook and say, yes, this is Matthew, this is Melissa, this is Abigail. So far, still faster to click on our face than getting the results and then correct it because basically we look alike. So that's, that's our experience. I'm sure, you know, in the next five years, every single aspect and every single content of an image is gonna be able to be identified and tagged. Um, but I don't really know even technology, uh, technologies today or, or software packages today that are integrated with them systems uh, that, do know, that actually take care of that. But if you have some, I will be more than happy to look at them because we know how much, how much value it can bring for any brand to be able to look at a product know exactly what this bottle of water is and how many of these images or videos uh, this bottle of water has been uh, displayed in. We definitely don't have it either, which, I mean, would be amazing. Uh, but one of the, the functions that we actually have built in is sort of a similar assets. Um, and basically, I mean, yes, most of our searching is done on the fields, but we've also designated, um, you know, for each asset type in our system, uh, shared uh, characteristics. So, you know, if I'm, I have a, you know, Shalom Harlow ad and, um, you know, all that metadata on one of them, there'll be uh, a box that says similar assets and then they'll probably below that be anything that we've determined to have shared characteristics. So you will see like six more ads with Shalom Harlow or maybe the same collection depending on the fields that we designated as to be a similar asset. So. It's, unfortunately, it's not as cool as facial rec recognition, um, but it's at least one way you can sort of browse um, the assets in the digital asset management with system without actually, you know, clicking a campaign name or typing in another subject. So we had an earlier meetup uh, about auto tagging and crowdsourcing and things like that. Uh, usually that technology uh, at this point in time is a, a great first pass, but usually there's still humans in the background doing the, the final edit or culling down to what is actually needed. Because uh, even if you smile, some, some technologies won't recognize you because your face magically changed. And it's like, oh no, I, I can't recognize you anymore unless all of the pictures of you are smiling. So who's responsible for metadata and who's checking it is the question. Huge question. Um, wow, okay. Um, so we have a lot of metadata creators. Uh, we try to utilize the people within the groups that are using it because they're the subject matter experts. They're going to know it. Um, and like I said earlier, we're trying to sort of sneakily get them to do metadata uh, because it is, it, it's, it's an uphill challenge. Um, so we have, we try to have the subject matter experts do it. Um, Barring that, um, like I said, I've got some interns. I would love to have someone, you know, full time because that would, I mean, it's sort of a, a liaison position where they, you know, work so closely with these assets, with these groups that they really do start to learn that vocabulary and learn all of those assets so that they can just easily tag it. Um, as far as quality control, oh, um, I really wish we were doing better at that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say. Um, but I guess the person who's checking it is me. Um, and it's more on a, a spot check basis where uh, usually what ends up happening is that a user will contact me and be like, I am doing this search and I can't find this. And then I just sort of troubleshoot with them and say, okay, like how are you doing the search? And maybe you're just sort of you know, thinking about it the wrong way and then I I'll discover that something's tagged incorrectly. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing since we're still so brand new. Um, 
but yeah, and, and I enter, I enter a lot of data myself. So um, I'm a party of one and a couple of interns. So it's a big job. Um, I also enter the met metadata, but within my team, I do have three archivists that work underneath me. I have a consultant that um, has been working with the company for now going on 40 years. So she's kind of like historian to look at these old photos and identify them and maybe work with one of our interns or attempts that we have that day to describe that photo or describe who's in that photo. Um, we do have temps doing it and I don't like really giving them the job because they might not know what it is or might describe it wrong. They could name it a puppy and it, we name it a dog or um, could be I don't know, a ring and they call it a diamond ring. Um, so the metadata is a little bit off on that. So quality control, I have to admit, yes, we are lacking on that too. So you're not the only one. Um, <laughs> uh, so, and then, yeah, I do it myself. Um, so it's just strictly the archives team. Um, we rely people to send us metadata. Um, with the assets that they send, but if they're cleaning out an office and send us 10 boxes, we obviously know that they're not gonna send us 10 pages worth of metadata of what's in that box that we need to digitize. Uh, so we do all of that work. The good news is a lot of people are using Lightroom and Bridge, uh, a lot of photographers are using that, so they tag all of their metadata, which is awesome. So when I upload an asset, all of that material is there, the, the event that this person was at, the person who was in that photo, the rights, who the photographer is, because that's always an issue going back of, can I have this asset, can we put it in the New York Times? Well, we don't know who the photographer is, but when that asset was uploaded, we knew who the photographer was, we knew to contact them ahead of time so we could release and get some usage rights out of that. So, um, but metadata is hard because we need to put it in and I always have this, uh, argument with other archivists and librarians about like more product, less process. We do more process on it. You know, we're describing this book that I have and to the T of, you know, the fabric on it, how many pages are and rather than them saying one blue book. So um, we describe it to a T because we know our users are gonna say, you know, send me that that blue leather book instead of we search for a book and we get 25 different images. So it could kind of search all the way down. So metadata is always key for us in our archives because they are very, um, they request very odd ending things that we need to describe. Yeah. On our side, I must say, you know, we see it all from, you know, dedicated archive department, like Melissa is going to have, you know, a, an entire team, you know, receiving assets that have nothing. You know, it's a box of archive. Like, you know, deal with it, that's 1958 and you know, good luck finding out who it is. Uh, but that's part of what we do. Uh, all the way to um, you know, people requiring the digital text and photographers on set to actually enter metadata. So we actually built in in global edit ways that you can force users to actually enter metadata. That means you're, you're forcing the naming convention. You have 20 fields of search. I'm going to pre-populate in your upload job five of these fields. I'm going to ask you to enter another five now I'm already, I'm already halfway done. I have 10 of them being done out of my 20s. So we know it's critical, and it's especially critical when you're dealing with third party people who are going to uh, provide assets to you. That means, you know, what does the photographer care about what's going to be used, uh, you know, in, in your system and how you're going to use it? Most of the time, they don't. So the only way of making sure that your metadata is gonna follow what you want is to actually you know, set it up this way. That means setting up which fields you're going to pre-populate, which fields you're going to require open upload. Now that's how much, you know, how you can use the system to actually force business rules that really help getting like halfway there. Now the second half, that's down to manual. Let's look at this picture, look at these fields, and yes, let's get the date of shoot, let's get who is on the picture, let's get the name of the campaign, let's get that SKU number for that ring. Like, you know, the description of the blue book, yeah, you know, we have software that can recognize it's blue, but you know what, we're gonna call it like sky blue. Uh, 
you know, nobody else except these two people in the department know that it's sky blue because that's a color that we've been using for the last 30 years. And this, it's still human beings, you know, thank God. I think it's a good thing that we, you know, humans still have value in, in that process. Um, but we see it all from, you know, behind the scene. We have, you know, a lot of things that come from legal, asking who enters it. We have people who actually um, deal with their legal database to actually feed global it at some point, and we're gonna ingest the system with rights and contracts and expiration dates directly coming from legal. So in the entertainment business, that's really common. So we have, you know, um, art directors are going to, you know, put like, you know, ratings directly in bridge. In that case, yes, the art director is actually feeding metadata and status in global edit. Now the photographers might do it, the digital tech might do it, the retouchers, you know, might actually do it with a version number or anything like that. You know, camera settings, technically you can say that, you know, Canon and Nikon actually fitting your uh, damn system because, you know, all our camera settings, when you actually took that shot, um, you know, or that video file actually goes as a metadata and is ingested. So technically it still enriches your metadata. Are you going to search for the type of lens that has been used? No. But is it there? Yes. Is one day going to be useful for whatever reason? Since you don't know, probably better to actually ingest it and see if anybody actually wants to use it later down the world. So what's being done to protect your digital assets and your cybersecurity? In Global Edit, um, you know, the goal of Global Edit is to have one central repository where um, the teams either internally or externally can find the assets. And I think that's one of the first things you want to do to secure it. Eliminate the copies that might be on somebody's desk on somebody's desktop, on the drive that is right here that nobody has any idea because it's been here for six months. So I think your first step is get something central, set a repository, and set the rights of who is going to have access to it. You know, once you make sure that people stop storing local files and like pieces of files and collections on different parts of the servers, um, if you have, you know, that scattered uh, way of storing uh, assets, basically, you know, you have no control of what's going on because that means it's outside of your dam, that means you don't know who accessed it, you don't know who printed it, you don't know if anybody took a USB key and actually left home with it. So your first step is actually get that central repository, whether it's web-based or locally on your servers, but you need to have it uh, you know, as a central uh, file system. Once you have that, um, you know, securing your files is really based on how, how much visibility do you wanna give to your library. So is it an internal facing? And you know, in, in the case of Melissa, for example, the archive department is responsible to search for assets and then deliver it to the brands. We have, um, you know, other of our customers at Global Edit and, and users who actually expose the library to everybody in the company and use the system as, you know, self-service library. That means that they have a way to secure assets within the, within the dam. That means depending on who you are, what department you're from, you know, what, what, what your responsibilities and rights are in the system, then you're going to be able to view, search, and do different things in the system. Maybe you have access only to the approved images. Maybe, you know, as soon as, you know, an asset expires and, you know, the photographer rights just expired, you don't have access to it anymore. So that's one, you know, these are like a lot of ways to, uh, to secure assets all the way down to, you know, I'm sharing, you know, 20 of these uh, assets with you, but you have only the right to see it and you don't have the right to download it. Maybe you have only the right to download it out of the row as with a watermark. And that's how we handle, you know, uh, the security of the assets. And all of this is tracked. So at any point, you know, Melissa was mentioning reporting. If you want to check who downloaded a file or every single file downloaded by any of the user of Global Edit, you can see it in a click if you are an admin of the system. So um, that really, you know, make everybody accountable. Um, you know, having a tracking system is in your dam is, you know, something that looks for a lot of people like, okay, that's like, you know, putting the police in the company. Yes, because we are trying to secure our assets. This is how important our digital assets are for the brand. So we need to know who is doing what and we need to make sure that we are the one controlling who is going to be able to do what on these assets? Can you receive and then share it with somebody else? Can you not download, you know, can you have on your PDF version of the file as a low res? All of these things is what is being designed when you actually set up your dam. And, you know, so central repository, user rights, are you exposing it internally or externally? Uh, and then, you know, what kind of disaster recovery and backup do you have? Because securing it is not only about, you know, misusage or like wrong use, uh, it's as well about losing. You know, security is like, I lost it, it's not here anymore. 
making people realize that this drive that is sitting in on this desk is not safe. It's not safe because people, somebody can take it, but it's not safe as well because this, safe, this drive might actually crash. And that means you lost 10 years of archive. Um, so, as Matthew said, um, we only have five users on Global Edit that could enter metadata, that could upload assets um, and delete assets. Um, but our end users could be thousands to 10,000 to 20,000. Um, and so our assets are, ser are on our local server, and they're also uploaded to Global Edit. Um, and technical-wise and security-wise, I don't know, but it has been approved by our IT team that it, they are a very secure website, and, and I'm sure if you, if you have any questions, they, they could go in more detail about it. But I, I stayed out of that conversation. I said, as long as we got the approval, it's secure, it's fine. Um, for in terms of request, there could be a new person that's coming in that really doesn't understand the archives but wants all of these advertisements, these old advertisements that we don't even have the rights to. And when those requests come in, it's kind of like, oh, I feel like I'm walking on some eggshells with this. And if I give them all these assets, they could download them and put it in a presentation and put them up on the screen and it's on YouTube. So that's why I couldn't show you anything today. Uh, I would love to show you our digital asset management, but how it works. Um, so those are all in Global Edit. If you requested all these ads and I kind of, it was a little fuzzy and I said go to legal for this, I would send you um, all, the, all the ads, watermark them, you can't download them, but um, at the end, whatever ones you want, you could hit approve, you could hit kill, and the ones that you approve, let's have a meeting with legal and see if they approve it. If they approve it, then I would give you access to download it. So there's a couple steps that we um, rely on legal to work with us on not exposing these images to someone that might not have rights to it or we might get in trouble for sharing. So our system is currently uh, mostly internal facing and the access is actually granted on a request basis. So. Um, it's not open to everyone, uh, they're definitely select users, um, but we add users all the time, so it's really, um, that's one way to keep it safe. We also have an incredibly extensive security model. It is, uh, it's really intense, uh, because it's not just, you know, you can browse, you can uh, search, you can share, you can download, you can edit the metadata, you can replace the asset, you can delete the asset, although, the only person who's allowed to delete it is me, because we figured we should really put a clamp on that. Um, and, and the same with replacing. So we've, you know, all of that stuff, sharing, um, everyone has different roles. Um, there really aren't that many people in our company uh, who have every uh, capability. So generally, a lot of people get, get the search browse, um, and then they can also download a high, medium, low resolution. Like, we really, run the gamut on, on what people are allowed and not allowed to do. Um, we are actually opening up uh, part of our system to our external partners. So we're creating asset kits, you know, so, uh, for the regional groups that we work with. Um, and that's been sort of the tricky part is like how do we, you know, keep them from going into the full library and just paging through and saying, oh, I want that image and taking that down. So we really had to sort of lock down and say, you can only see this module and you can only see this part of the module. Um, and that's, you know, it's really just about security. Uh, as far as the technical specs go, I'm really not the person to talk about that. Um, but again, our IT group has, has gone through it with a fine tooth comb, so it sits behind all sorts of firewalls and, um, and yes, back up those copies. Your, your library locks, lots of copies, keep stuff safe. And, you know, I'm sorry, what, just one last comment, you know, talking about security. What, one thing that we go through, you know, every time when we have this question is, the first one is like, what is your security today? What do you have? Or what is your fear? Your fear that, you know, this file can be accessed, let me take your drive here. How do you know I have it? So let's compare to what you have when you don't have a dam. Let's start with that, because right now you don't even know it exists, you don't know where it is, and you don't know who has it. If you actually can answer this question first, 
I think you're going to relieve a lot of the stress and the questions about security. It's like, I already gave you a security that is like a thousand times higher than what you used to have 10 seconds ago. Let, let's start with that. So, and when you add backup and you add disaster recovery, it's like, okay, do you think it's better with or do you think it's better without? Now let's work together to make sure that we go from 1,000 times to a million times higher security for your assets. Because one thing that is true is that people will find a way to get access to these assets and they will find a way to use them because they have a job to do. Whether it's for you know, a campaign, you know, it's for PR, it's for a presentation, they will take a screen grab out of an old website that has been done for 10 years and put it on that PowerPoint that will end up on YouTube. Whether you know about it or not, it will happen. And you know, our job is pretty much to make sure that if this happens, I'd rather be the one that actually selects what is going to be on YouTube because we know what the company rules are. So people are going to use their personal email. They're going to use like, you know, their USB keys. They're going to get a Dropbox account. They're going to hightail documents to everybody. Whether you want it or whether you know it, it's going to happen. So if we put a system that allows them to do all that, but have some accountability and tracking and things that you can actually control, you're really already inc increasing the security. So I, I, to us, the first question is like, what do you have today? And the answer most of the time before them is nothing. Unless it has been sent by email and you actually archive every single email in the company, it's nothing. Any system is going to be used. People are going to take CDs home and like DVDs and like USB and leave home with that, you know, a contract or, you know, a screenshot of something and they're going to use it. So if you already cover these points, you're already, you know, mile away more secure than before the dam was actually implemented. Thanks again.